I gotta do this for our press person. Okay, great. Doing the thing. Where's those slides? Oh, that's just me. What's that about? Okay, so we're talking about the climate transition and the role of disruptive deep tech, but let's start by just talking about how things are going so far. So in 2022, WWF uh, released a, a study that actually took about 50 years to go do, where they were tracking the, the progress of 32,000 wildlife populations spanning 5,000 different species that are kind of hallmarks of what was happening in those ecosystems and how those organisms, of course, in particular, were doing. And what they found out is that, on average, there was a 70% decline, 69%, um, decline in the actual amount of, of organisms of those species. Some were hit a lot worse. There were some parts of the world that were more than 90%, some parts obviously a little bit less than 70%. But to be very crisp, like we oftentimes talk about extinction as the, the main damaging thing that we can do to nature, we're emptying out nature. You know, this is basically saying 70% of, of these organisms have, uh, in terms of population count, are gone now. Right? And we can't do that again. If, if in the next 50 years we wipe out a similar amount, we're just kind of out of nature at that point. Beyond that, we've just had um, over a year and a half of the hottest open ocean temperatures ever recorded in, you know, in modern history. And what this is driving is mass coral bleaching and death. So it's estimated that in this past year and a half, um, we have lost somewhere between 35 to 50 percent of all coral coverage on planet Earth. And we're basically on trajectory to extinct corals, uh, coral reefs from planet Earth by around the year 2055. Now, as soon as we do that, we instantly wipe out 25 percent of all marine species. Um, in addition, there's about 10 to 15 percent, even though they don't live on the reef directly, their food chain or the reproduction chain depends on the reef. So, we will directly extinct that 25%. We might extinct an additional 10 to 15% beyond that, those species uh, just by the kind of related effects of getting rid of that ecosystem from planet Earth. And this is the legacy, right? Like, you know, when, when you know, some of you guys are already at that point in life, some of you guys, actually the young delegates are right in front, right? The young delegates, like, Someday, when you're talking to your grandkids about this, this will be the century where we either completely lost nature on planet Earth, or we didn't. And if we ended the century and we had gotten to the right temperature for planet Earth, but we had emptied it out of all interesting you know, biodiversity in life, I think we've failed pretty horribly. Right now, we're actually not on track to achieve either of the things, but you know, it doesn't mean that we can't change course. There's plenty of time to go do it. I think we just have to be real about where it is right now. Now, let's get into the money, because this is obviously a, a finance conference. But, you know, this is from the Climate Tech VC folks that rebranded as Sightline. And, um, and, you know, you'll note that the, the, in terms of where Climate Tech you know, VC has put its money, the largest bar by a lot is transportation. And that was about 53% of all the capital that went into climate tech. Now, that was speaking to um, allegedly 15% of the emissions pie. In practice, most of that went to light vehicles that represent less than half of that 15%. So it means that 53% of all the money that we've put into climate has gone to address about 7%, you know, plausibly address 7% of the problem. We haven't addressed it yet. This is basically all the money shooting for, for 7%, and we're not going to get all 7%. And when you do that math, you're like, maybe we're allocating this pretty poorly, actually. Right? Like, there, there, there is something about this which is actually not driving an obviously efficient market. This is massively imbalanced relative to what actually needs to happen. So, and actually, um, as Tom Sire basically said, you know, uh, in, in the session right before this, that, you know, of the things in energy, we're really focused on electricity. You know, the, the phrase is being used a lot, the hard to de decarbonize sectors. Those are the places where we basically aren't putting as much money, aren't making as much progress, and it is same order of magnitude, basically, you know, 
it's like 22% of emissions compared to electricity generations, 25% of emissions. It's basically the same thing. Also, food and agriculture is 26% of emissions, right? We're basically failing really badly at these things that are as big as electricity generation and not really looking at them. Now, this is where the, the kind of purpose of deep tech comes in, because we call those things hard to decarbonize because we have not figured out how to decarbonize them yet. And it means that there's a knowledge gap that we need to work out, an innovation gap that needs to be worked out, and that is where the role of deep tech comes in. Now, when people talk about advanced technology today, a lot of the thought, just given the, the recent work that's been you know, coming out of the tech world in Silicon Valley, so it's kind of my fault as, as much as anybody else's fault, um, is that, oh, well, it's going to be some kind of AI software-y type thing. No, I'm sorry, right? This entire software will eat the world idea, it's actually useless relative to this work, right? If you go to a steel plant, you're not going to find a line of code running on the plant. Maybe there'll be a line of code in a PLC, uh, you know, in the firmware. But that's not really what people mean by, by software is going to eat the world. So what line of code are you going to change that's going to decarbonize that steel plant? And yet we see a bunch of companies starting that's like, oh, well, you know, it's enterprise SaaS, guys. It's got to be, it's got to be software. That's the, that's the stuff that gets funded. Now, getting funded is not the same thing as solving the problem. I think it's very simple, right? The problem looks more like this. And I'm seeing way fewer deals in terms of these hard to decarbonize sectors, steel, aluminum, cement, glass, paper, right? These things are not even be talked about, but you know, widely talked about, but, but those sorts of things are the physical materials that we make the modern world out of. And unless we're just deciding not to use those anymore at all, then we've got to go work out the deep tech that allows us to actually innovate the production process and change how these things are made foundationally. And, you know, I, I run a venture firm. All we do is the, the hard to decarbonize sectors. We, we have one software investment out of 41 investments. Everything else is physical, manufacturing, the changing of the core industries that need to change to be able to go address this. And what, what does addressing it actually look like? I think there's a really important point um, that, we, that we've recently learned from, you know, some of the successes that we've had. So, the Montreal Protocol passed in 1987, and in about nine years, it completely eliminated CFCs from, um, from the developed world. They gave the developing world an additional 15 years, but by 2010, effectively, um, no more CFCs from the developing world either. And what you're seeing is, great, we actually stopped the massive decline, it finally kind of bottomed out, but the actual repair of nature takes some time. Now, luckily, we made the choice in 1987 because it means by about 2060, the ozone layer will be back to health. We'll be back to the health that it was 100 years prior. But all these things that we're talking about in terms of, oh, let, we got to decarb, the, this is just the, it's still on the downslope part of it, right? Even if we were successful in all the goals that all the people in this room are after, this is us just stopping the things so we bottom out. And I think we need to realize that the time it takes for the ice caps just to refreeze, even if I could snap my fingers and everything was actually just magically solved this second, that would still be in another 70 to 100 years for the, the cryosphere to stabilize. I mean, I think we're very much misunderstanding time. I think we're very much misunderstanding that we are living in a physical world and that financial abstractions don't magically change the physical world. Uh, I'm, I'm a physicist by training. The physical world actually uh, trumps every possible thing that you can imagine in the economic world. And then we pretend that it doesn't. We play these local games that are not the real game that is actually happening. Well, this, is the, this year is the year that the most coral that will ever die is going to die. Because after we lose you know, 40, 50% this year, then it'll be on a smaller base. So sure, if we lose 50% of that base, then yeah, that's a massive loss, but still a way smaller area. And yet, we are not even talking about this particular thing. So I think it's really important to get in our minds that this is what the actual task looks like. This is a multi-hundred-year project where we have the most important thing to do right now 
in the next 50 years so that this bottoms out and the curve actually arrives back at a repair. But the depth of the work is, is really profound and much deeper than the conversations that I've been hearing. Now, I'll end on something I think is provocative, but also um, just really interesting, drives a bunch of questions. So over on the left-hand side, you see a schematic of the, of the Occidental Petroleum Direct Air Capture Plant, which they, you know, doesn't exist yet, but they're talking about breaking ground sometime in the next year or so, estimated to cost between two to three billion to construct. And their claim to fame is that, oh, once this is actually in operations, it's going to be sequestering 100 times more than all 19 existing direct air capture plants on planet Earth combined. Now, that sounds like that would be a big deal. But according to my calculations, then that plant over its lifetime is going to sequester roughly the same amount of carbon as 200 beavers. Now, you guys are like, the, the hell? What are beavers doing? Well, here's what beavers do. So what happens is when you put a dam into a, a stream system, a river system, all that sort of thing, it actually becomes a sediment trap for the entire watershed that is leading up to it. So imagine a huge land area where there's organic matter and all these sorts of regular activities happening. And as you know, things die and break off and that sort of thing, there's little bits of organic matter and sediment that are coming down the stream. Now, normally, in the absence of a dam, it just keeps on rolling. And if it has a long enough residency time in the water, it will go decay. Uh, the organic material in the water will decay back to carbon dioxide or methane. Now, if it hits a beaver dam, what happens is it settles at the bottom and then sediment covers it. As soon as the sediment covers it, instead of decaying in the presence of oxygen, it decays anoxically. And because it decays anoxically, it cannot become CO2. There's no oxygen available for that to be the case. So the carbon actually stays trapped in the soils. And we see this because wetland soils are called histosols. And histosols basically have 10, 20, 30x the carbon carrying capacity of, of regular soils that you might walk on a farmland or, or in your yard. Right? And actually, we know how carbon concentrating these sorts of environments are because most of our current oil and gas deposits used to be wetlands. This is the process that concentrates carbon in nature incredibly. And, and as opposed to this plant over here, which uses a huge percentage of its balance of plant on the energy just to suck the air through so that they can spend more energy on sorbing, desorbing, so that the, et cetera, et cetera, right? Instead of this, the beaver, the energy for that just comes from the gravity in the watershed. All the raw materials like come to it. And basically, it just does its one action. Also, labor-wise, these are very inexpensive to employ. <laughs> I was trying to go calculate this, but like this is, you know, over on the left, that's us basically paying a million X too much per ton. And this shows to me like how big the disconnect is in terms of where our vision is, in terms of where we even decide to look. The kinds of things, because this thing on the left is highly financeable. I think that's a really tough question for all these finance people in the room, right? Why is this financeable at two to three billion, and why is that not financeable? Uh, you know, why are the beavers not financeable? It's because we don't know how to financially enclose them. And as much as we talk about efficient markets, the truth is the things that are easily traded and enclosed, those are the things that we prefer, right? Those are the things that succeed in markets. And the things that are not easily enclosed, because, you know, how do you financially enclose a beaver? I don't know. Like, then those are the things that are not tradable, even if they're literally a million times better, right? So this, to me, is a provocation on a bunch of things that are broken, and I think I could have a 10-hour lecture just on what this implies about the decisions that we've made and the game that we've chosen to play, but it's certainly the wrong game. And ultimately, we're going to need the actual solve. The actual solve will come, especially in the industries that we care to keep, will come through real technical innovation, real depth of work that allows us to go transform how those foundationally work not just play economic games on how things are accounted. So thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay.